Welcome. I'm Martin Arthur, Chair of Electrical and Systems Engineering. It's indeed a privilege for me to introduce the inaugural Cox Distinguished Lecture. We're also fortunate that Jerry Cox is here with us today. Jerry? Um, I got to know Jerry 45, yes, 45 years ago when he invited me to join Floyd Noley uh, to write a review of medical signal uh, analysis for an article in the proceedings of the IEEE. In addition to mentoring young faculty, Jerry founded the Biomedical Computer Computing Laboratory in 1964, where he pioneered work in radiation treatment planning, created computer methods for reconstructing images from CT and PET scans, and developed early monitors for cardiac arrhythmias. In 1975, he became the founding chairman of the Department of Computer Science here. He co-founded Growth Networks, a company acquired by Cisco that produced an advanced networking chipset. In 2007, he started Blendix, Blended Integrated Circuit Systems, which provides system-on-chip design tools and services. As is clear, Jerry is still very active. Earlier this year, I got to hear him talk on the development of a regional internet exchange for St. Louis at a workshop in the Cortex Innovation District. Roger Brockett, our speaker for the inaugural Cox Distinguished Lecture, is also a longtime friend and colleague. He delivered the inaugural Zaborski Lecture on behalf of the System Science and math department here in 1990. His topic then was combinatorial optimization, neural networks, and adaptive control. Roger is the Anwang Research Professor of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science in the School of Engineering and Applied Science at Harvard. He taught for six years in the Electrical Engineering Department at MIT before joining Harvard in 1969. He is one of the most influential pioneers and leaders in the field of systems and control theory with seminal contributions to differential geometric methods in nonlinear control, the geometric approach to sufficient statistics problem in problems in nonlinear estimation, formal languages for motion control, hybrid systems, flows for computation related to integrable systems, stabilization theory, quantum control, robotics, and optimal control of Markov processes. More recently, his work has involved problems arising from the study of intelligent machines. Roger has received major awards from the IEEE, ASME, SIAM, and the American Automatic Control Council. Roger is a member of the U.S. National Academy of Engineering. He has directed more than 60 PhD dissertations, and authored at least 200 research papers. Roger's topic today is shallow learning for acquiring basic motor skills. Thank you for coming. Uh, thank you, Jershon and organizers. Uh, for inviting me. It's been a pleasure to have this opportunity where I've met uh, at least a dozen people that I've known for uh, God knows how many years, uh, but don't see every day anymore. So uh, all that is on the plus side. The title of my uh, talk is meant to be something like a sharp stick in the eye to certain hallowed thoughts about deep learning. I listen so often to titles of people who are talking about deep learning in somewhat religious terms, and I want to um, suggest today that there might be more to be said. Is the light microphone on? I turn mine on. Can you hear me? Much better. Much better, okay. All right, too bad you missed that. That was one of my best lines. 
<laughs> okay, so I've been on a crusade for the last few years to make speakers uh, say how their talk is supposed to be judged. And they can only do that if they announce what the goal of their talk is. I mean, you wouldn't want to judge a talk by something that the speaker didn't have in mind. So, but we don't know most of the time because we don't know what they, what they consider to be uh, the goal of the talk. So my goal today is twofold. One is to engage you in a set of ideas that might be new to you or might not be, but in any case, I'm pretty sure I'll have a different interpretation of them. And the second thing is, is uh, I want to support the idea, which you've seen in abundance already today, that uh, thinking about problems that we do only partly understand or don't understand at all, thinking about them in terms of boxes and interconnections, uh, and then taking the step of mathematically describing the boxes rather than trying to do the whole system at once is a useful methodology. So I'm going to talk today about, um, you see, politicians know to sh kiss babies is a good idea. Mathematicians haven't yet learned that showing pictures of happy babies is also a good thing, but I'm, I think it is. Anyway, by way of contrast, uh, La Punoff is a very well-known figure in the uh, world of mathematical stability theory. And he wrote his thesis more than 100 years ago about the problem of stability of ships. Now, uh, Lagrange had already written about static stability um, nearly a hundred years before, but what distinguished Lyapunov's work from uh, previous studies was a systematic way of thinking about dynamic stability. That is, uh, proceeding from the differential equations, identifying the equilibrium points, uh, giving a method for studying the stability of the equilibrium point that did not depend on linearity. So that was a good thing. And what I want to say is, is that although later on, perhaps these exemplars of uh, a child here will want to study number theory or something other than just grabbing onto a stick or stably sitting up, or learning to how to stand up for the first time, which uh, if you are a parent, you would know that that's one of the most um, life-affirming things that you can imagine, is to see an 18-month-old grab onto a table and fail many times and eventually be able to stand up. So the question is, how do they do it? Does it have something to do with Lyapunov? Okay, so here's the hypothesis that I want to explore. A is that stabilizing is a learned property of the nervous system. And uh, it is furthermore, it's learned in primitive forms at a very early age. It's not just learned once and forgotten forever, but the in initial learning of motor control in the form of stabilizing is learned quite early and therefore it's uh, a candidate for studying learning in general. Um, a popular idea, which I'll illustrate more in the next slide, a popular idea is that learning should take the form of a layered feed-forward network and a lot of work has been done on that. But that's to be contrasted with the idea that maybe it's slow and time consuming and mathematically speaking unreliable um, 
to try to optimize a multi-layer feed-forward network. On the other hand, another model for learning that is not has not received as much attention but is in, increasingly of interest is you postulate that you have a large collection of interacting neurons or if you want to be just mathematical and not say anything that might be wrong in neuro, terms of neuroscience or not mention the word neuroscience. Did the, the mic fell down? No, that's a bad thing. So you can just think of them as differential equations. And so imagine a thousand or five thousand ordinary differential equations. And, and I'll say something about the coupling in a minute. But anyway, these uh, equations are connected up in such a way that they are more or less on the verge of instability. That is to say, they will be not sitting there uh, doing nothing. They will be interconnected with each other and generating signals. And if you thought of that as a tabula rasa, uh, sort of the blank slate, of what's in a mind before uh, anything happens, then a plan would be is to try to generate a feedback loop to the muscle system that would just take some kind of linear combination of all the junk that's going on in this recurrent network and uh, pick the best one and see if it works. So putting that in terms of some more uh, engineering or mathy kind of appearance, or maybe computer science-y kind of appearance. So on top, you have the model of the deep learning, where you have some kind of target or goal that you would like to associate with an input. So typical problem is the uh, post office wants to read uh, zip codes off letters. The target is the correct one of the existing zip codes. And the input is a picture of what someone's written on the envelope. And you have these multi-layer feed-forward network in which uh, post office pays people money to determine the weights of the interconnections between the layers and uh, gives you a prize if you get more than 98% accuracy with reading the zip codes. Contrast that with an idea where you have a recurrent network, so where the signals move forward and backward. Again, and again, you have inputs as you do in the um, deep learning case. And on the contrast side, you have just a linear functional of everything in sight that best matches the target. So why is that better? Well, the trade-off really is, is a optimization that's highly nonlinear in the case of the feed-forward, multi-layer feed-forward network, but which is just a least squares fit guaranteed to have a single local minimum, which is also global, and could be solved um, easily, except for the fact that now you've traded off a complicated problem in relatively low dimension with a simple problem in high dimensions but simple but learnable. Okay, so here are some pros and cons about that. Um, gradient descent in both cases, complicated in the feed-forward case by the fact that the problem's nonlinear. Um, the reservoir, which I haven't mentioned so far, requires 
data logging, that is to say you have to collect a uh, interval of data, you have to log it, and then that is the data that goes into the least squares fitting process. So it's not only higher dimensional, but it's also uh, you have to, to collect a lot of data. Okay, so just to uh, justify the slide, or justify the talk in part, I put up some a canonical wiki, Wikipedia picture of uh, the idea that uh, we have sensory and motor, and they're connected. The only thing I'm talking about today is the stuff at the bottom. As how do you connect the sensory part to the motor part if, in fact, you want to do some of these very elementary processes? Again, I'm going to talk about the case where the networks involved are recurrent. Okay, so let's get more specific for a second. And this is uh, on my way to something that I'll uh, ask you to suspend disbelief for for a while. Uh, just bear with this subject. This is, I'm not being original here. In fact, there's not too much original in the talk except for the babies. So the surprisingly simple picture, x dot equals minus alpha x plus, now, what is that? x is maybe 2,000 dimensional. Tanch of ax plus bu, well, the tanch function is to be applied one component at a time. So it's just, if the ith component is yi, tanch of yi. So because tanch is saturated, that looks like that, and because a, alpha x, will eventually dominate, all solutions of this equation are bounded. So it's not like anything's going to sneak off to infinity here. It's going to be bounded. So what could it do? It could wander around in some chaotic way. It could oscillate. It could go to equilibrium points, if uh, there are any. But all that depends on the properties of A. And what you uh, can say is, is that if A, think of, forget uh, the BU term for just a minute. So tanch A has a slope of 1 at 0. So if you take alpha to be, well, sorry, if, if the elements of A were diagonal and they were positive, you'd be able to find a value of alpha such that this was just on the verge of instability. So think about that case. Um, I'll say some more things about sparseness of A and B in a minute or two. But uh, if you are a control theory person, take some comfort from the fact that if I were giving a highly mathematical talk, I'd say at this point that A and B have to be controllable. So now let me tell you a story about what simulations have shown. And because I'm talking about simulations, you know I'm not talking about proving anything. I'm just giving you examples of things. So here is a experiment. It's, this is an experiment that's uh, advertised very well by a certain circle of folks. A certain circle of folks are people who talk about echo state computing or reservoir computing. And I won't try to justify those names for just a second, but I will, I will tell you what it is that uh, this experiment does. 
So suppose you take a source here that generates an interesting signal. And let's say that signal was maybe um, some kind of chaotic motion, such as the Lorenz system or whatever your favorite chaotic system is. doesn't matter. And what you do is you, for a while, you connect the source to the reservoir. So going back to the equation that involved AX plus BU, you let U be the source. And you run the equation X dot equals minus alpha X plus tanch AX plus BU. I haven't told you what A is, uh, so for now, think of A as being a relatively sparse, relative to what? Highly sparse matrix, and think of B as being rather sparse, and uh, but random, Ran a random initial choice. There was somebody who was suspicious about randomness earlier today. They can have their say, but I'm letting this be random. Now, you let that run for a while, and then after you've accumulated those trajectories, you choose C, a linear functional of those 5,000 variables, in such a way as to match as closely as possible the source. So this is a retrospective match. Then what you do is separate the source, cut the source off, and feed back the output that, that was in the process of being generated, feed it back and use that in place of the source. So with 5,000 variables, you might uh, easily imagine that you're doing a good job of replicating the source. And in fact, experiments show that that is often the case. So then you feed it back and you say, well, if I replace the source by this fairly good model of the source, how well do you do? So that gives rise to uh, hundreds of papers. And uh, so what simulations show? Uh, let me know. So I just write the equation here to make sure everybody's got it. After the learning period is over and C is fixed, then you've got the equation that's shown there, the differential equation that's shown there. And you have an output Y equals CX, at, where we've replaced the U. I'm, I'm just calling out in terms of mathematics, what I already said in terms of words, replace U by C transpose X. Okay. There's an example of showing what happens after you close the loop and the learning is after the learning is over. So the signal here is red. Sorry, the signal here is blue. And red overwrites the blue for, the, for a while because they are identical from 160 to 166 or something. This is not, this is, this, um, is due to Ed Ott and his team at the University of Maryland. But after 10 units of time, this starts to diverge. But think about what a miracle this is, that it happened at all. So we connect this A matrix randomly, choose B randomly, fit the data to the past, then extrapolate with our best guess, and it works like a charm for a rather unpredictable looking curve. Okay, now, clearly, this can only work if the past has some relevance to the future. So, it's obviously not 
designed to work for the stock market, although I'm sure some people will try. It should work if it's going to work at all. It should work for differential equations because their future has everything to do with their past. And so that's a reasonable test case, something that is predictable based on the past. Now, babies see a lot of things that are predictable on the basis of the past. They don't necessarily see them quickly, but they do see them. I can remember our oldest child checking out gravity for, with his pudding for quite a while on the high chair. It always went down, and it only took God knows how many trials, but the past was a pretty good predictor. Okay. Is this magic? So, I didn't take the trouble to replace the cards by the predicted signal over here. That would have been better if I had done that, but it was too much trouble. You have to dig into the various pieces of the web picture, and it just seemed easier to do it this way. Anyway, so is it magic, or can we provide some explanation, and, and in the process of providing the explanation, then provide some indication as to what the limitations are on this kind of uh, learning? Okay, so less magic, more analysis. So here's a, here's a good problem for, there must be somebody here who knows he wants to write or she knows she wants to write a PhD thesis but doesn't know the topic. Okay, so here's a question for you. If I give you A, N by N, so it has N squared entries, and I, let's not talk about B for a minute, n squared entries, and I tell you that you can only choose, oh, let's say 2n, oh, maybe give you 4n, non-zero entries, and put them in there. And then I ask you, under what circumstances would it be that for most of those allocations of non-zeroness, that the A matrix would be reducible in the sense that it would, in the proper ordering of variables, split up into block diagonal forms or block up or triangular forms. What fraction of the n square of the choices of four uh, n squared choose four n would it be uh, true that there were five blocks or true that there would be ten blocks or that whole number? So there's a whole profile of the number of blocks as related to the number of choices of non-zero entries. Okay, I worked on that problem a little bit, didn't solve it, but I'll go back to it. Anyway, what, what you discover is that it's really quite likely if you have a sparse A, that this will split up. So what does that mean? That means it's quite likely that the equation will split up into parts that either operate independently or one part operates independently, feeds into another part, which then operates in the triangular a block triangular form. So it's not unreasonable to imagine that the things that are being generated by the reservoir uh, are in fact independent things uh, close to instability and available by C to make a linear combination that then would mimic the output. So, um, good. Maybe that happens. But, you see, the reservoir is such an arbitrary structure 
that if you put stuff in front of it, like system A in the lower picture, that's just another reservoir. And if you put something beside it, like system B in the top diagram, that's just a different reconstruction problem. So you could use this reservoir model together with tinkering around with blocks here and there to do a wide variety of things. So you could uh, imagine choosing a system B or A and B together in such a way as to make the system not look like the source, but look like something even nicer than the source. Now, remember that the baby cannot violate Newton's laws. So he's got to deal with gravity. He's got to deal with the way muscles and limbs and uh, F equals MA works. So he does have a very specific uh, system, and he might want to make that system look simple. What would look simple? Well, the first thing that we learn, perhaps, is that if something feels good, do more of it. And if something feels less, do less, bad, do less of it. So that's a feedback loop. We put that statement in feedback form. That just looks like putting minus one in a feedback loop. So if, in fact, we had a short-term predictor of what's good and what's bad, we might be able to, exp we might be, we might expect to be able to stabilize that system, even though in the long run the model was incorrect, we might be able to stabilize that system based on a short-term predictor and a very simple, if it feels good, do more of it, if it feels bad, do less of it rule. Okay. So, that could be learning to stabilize without calculus, which seems to be appropriate. This is, in fact, producing something rather sophisticated from the point of view of what control theory students, some people object to calling everything control theory, what control students would have been taught since the 1930s, namely dynamic compensation. You can think of it not just as applying a simple negative K feedback around it, but to say, all right, the reservoir can build for me a dynamic compensator. And what, what we're doing is with our C vector, we're just choosing the best one. All right, so returning to the earlier cartoon, I've added now just one thing here at the bottom, namely, C would be this little part of the diagram. Uh, and choosing C would have to be learned, but the learning process is one of matching. And if you think of, well, maybe matching by looking at examples. Or so if you see, if the child sees an adult standing up, wouldn't standing up be a good idea? So uh, I'm not going to say too much about that more. OK, so it's from this point of view, it's all about choosing H in this equation here. So here's the equation for the baby and the reservoir, his neural machinery. And uh, it provides an open loop description. He has to choose H in such a way that the simple feedback loop, U equals HX, will uh, do what is needed. OK. Um, all right, so let's add some equations to this picture. Um, 
right. We've got a differential equation that the source satisfies because it, it can't predict things that are uh, in which the future has no relation to the past. Um, it switches back and forth. Now, that's um, pretty easy to see what I mean by that. And we have a, a part of the solution which is fitting and part of the solution which is extrapolation. Okay, so now suppose that you thought of the um, reservoir as a sea of oscillators. So I've written down the equation of a damped oscillator there on top, and I've given it a parameter, z. And z is to take on 5,000 different values. z belongs to a set s. And these equations are coupled to the input by a variable b of z, u. So in that circumstance, and if epsilon is, well, if epsilon zero, what is this reservoir doing? It's simply generating a raft, uh, a big collection of sinusoidals with sine and cosine independently represented and therefore independently available to C, and that gives you a way to approximate the past by a Fourier series. Okay, so I think the veil should be starting to lift. The reservoir is not really... When I first saw this, I was extremely skeptical as to how this could work. But I think if you think of it, I mean, you, you can object to this model in a million ways because you say, well, why should, why should it be 5,000 harmonic oscillators? It might be some other junk. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. And especially if you say, well, you know, that might be fine for some silly engineer, but I'm a neuroscientist and I know that we don't have momenta in the brain. So I don't want to hear about masses and springs and things that oscillate. Have it your way for the minute, but not for long. Anyway, you put those, a sea of oscillators together like that, and then it becomes perfectly reasonable that there should be a way to, in the short term, simulate the signal that you were trained on. So it seems it begins to seem quite reasonable. Well let's let's check some of the pros and cons of that point of view. How long would you expect a damped sine of wave to work? Well, you'd expect it to be related to the damping constant. If, if, it, you know, if, the, if the signal really were periodic and you really did have a Fourier expansion, you would only expect it to work sort of exponentially badly as e to the minus t epsilon t grows. So you wouldn't expect it to work forever, but you'd expect to be able to... Um, determine an estimate on that. Why do you need epsilon at all? Well, if, if you take a geometric point of view and you say, what this oscillator should be doing is heading to some invariant manifold that represents the past. So this is an invariant manifold associated with the sea of oscillators or associated with the native system. Uh, and we want trajectories to suck down 
onto that manifold. We want that manifold to be stable. But it won't be unless you put some damping into the system. So this fellow, Epsilon, has competitive roles. On one hand, it helps because it drives the system to the manifold that represents the past, which is a good thing. On the other hand, it limits the amount of time you can expect the extrapolation to work because it hurts the extrapolation. So, two-edged sword. I have to say that in the stability context, I want to say this just the right number of times, but I'll, I don't think I've reached that yet. So, for stability, because Lyapunov showed us that stability was a local in time question, that is to say it was governed by a differential equation, and therefore local, that means we don't have to have a model that's good forever. We just have to have a model that's good for delta t. So it's OK for the reservoir not to work forever. So this puts into more concrete form, perhaps, what I've been talking about. Namely, I say, all right, up there, we have an input. Well, unfortunately, I've used u two different ways. Sorry about that. But up here, u is a collection of sine waves. The frequencies in those sine waves cannot reasonably be identified with the frequencies in the sine waves of the reservoir. The reservoir came randomly to us. The input terms could be anything. So we will have a frequency mismatch. There will be frequencies in the input which are not present in the output. How do you, what penalty do you pay for trying to represent a periodic signal whose base frequencies are not the same as your approximating signals? Well, I hope it's on the next slide, but it isn't. Uh, I'll come back to that later. That's, uh, the penalty is not so bad. I'll give you an equation in due time. Uh, anyway, but I want to own up to the fact that we can't expect the reservoir to have the same frequencies as the input, and, I'm, and it's not necessary that it does. OK, so let's, this, this could be viewed as a little bit of an aside, but um, I'm trying to disarm all potential critics, and that means anybody who might be thinking that biological systems don't oscillate. Well, probably they do. Here's why. Um, I'm going to show you a system that is of this form and does oscillate. So look at that little sweetheart of equations up there right in the upper left-hand piece. Isn't, you know, those, are, those are good. You could teach those to your kids, right? No funny coefficients, just ones and threes. No funny functions, just a tanch. Repeated three times even. It oscillates. If you look at the trajectories over here, on the um, your right hand side, you can see, well, they look pretty much like sine waves, don't they? 20 feet, 30 feet, they look like sine waves. Like a lot of things I've talked about today, I'm, these are not original with me. I mean, these particular ones are, but there's, this idea is not original with me. This, um, 
as uh, Elowitz and Lieber studied equations of this form in connection with uh, cell biology. But the point is that here are some equations that involve biological-like entities, no obvious connection with masses or springs. Um, first order time constant systems with sigmoidal nonlinearities. That's all. So it's not, uh, if you're going to argue against my model, you shouldn't argue against it on the basis that it used sine waves, because um, they can come from anywhere. What's a little bit amusing about that is that, you know, once, once you get a taste of something good, you are bound to try to get more of it. So with those three equations, you might be thinking you could get, well, why not two? Well, you can't do two because what you want to do is to pick an odd ordered system so that the most undamped eigenvalues are in fact complex. And that will happen if A is of order three or five, or seven, or nine, or whatever. But it will not happen if it's of even order. So this is a small footnote, but sinusoidal walking oscillations are certainly possible uh, with uh, systems that look like time constants and, and ordinary nonlinearities. OK. so. The C of oscillators, if you take the C to be a continuum, you could identify that with just plain old uh, Laplace transform representation of signals. That's a good thing. Um, I talked uh, about this already with the fact that uh, the damping in the oscillation is uh, something that has got its good aspects and its bad aspects. But as I mentioned at that time, decay keeps the solution on the manifold that we want to be and we can't do without it. Uh, all right, so the frequency mismatch question is talked about here, but not the way I wanted it to be. There it is. Look at the bottom very last equation here. So if you describe the error between sine zt and sine wt, and you do that over a finite interval of length t, you get terms like this. And so you see that the error actually goes to 0 as, as t goes to 0. So, I'm um, sorry, no, you don't see that. What you see is that you have to do that integration, but then you see as t goes to zero, the error goes to zero. So, um, that can be estimated mathematically. I'm not going to say more about that. Okay, I mentioned the problem about what are the chances of a system that is sparsely connected being controllable. Lots of, lots of chance to show that you're smarter than your advisor there. Um, you could systematically explore some of the questions that I've talked about here. Namely, I've given you some indication as to why in an ideal, very high dimensional world, this should work. But that begs the question of how well does it work for 5,000 or 500 or 50? Um, lots of exploration in parameter space to be done. Um, I mentioned this, this, the probability of a system being controllable or probability of system splitting up into irreducible parts. Um, and that 
is as much as I want to say. Thank you. Sine waves are beautifully smooth things. Uh, I never saw a spike train I liked. They do, they do have a lot of activity, but you have to work hard to get something that's spike-like. I mean, I've simulated Hodgkin Huxley. I've simulated Fitsu Nagamo. They're pain in the neck. These little sweetheart equations are just nice. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, um, I'll admit that I'll admit that you can see lots of spiky stuff, but I don't want to try to approximate sine t with a bunch of spikes. I want something nice. Well, no, I, not to my knowledge. Uh, what, but I wouldn't think one would want to look exactly that way. I would think you'd want to look at smooth, somehow smooth versions of spike trains. So spike trains, after they've synchronized and split out in phase and passed through a first order Felder, I mean, we saw talks like that today about how good it would be if our sine waves just weren't in phase. So maybe you run those through a first order filter and it looks something like this. Your source was uh, chaotic all the time, right? Your source, in your examples, were chaotic. Well, Sheree, you have to do something, okay? Um, it, I, I don't think it had to be chaotic. It could have been. A, oh, it could be the orbit of Uranus. I don't know. It does. I don't think it matters. Oh, I have absolutely no uh, training or authority with which to speak, but introspectively, I believe that we think with our bodies as much as our minds. I mean, we all watch people talk with their hands, and they can't talk if they take them, tie them behind their backs. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> 